Next, we have Dr. Srinjke Bansali Memorial Oration. For that, I welcome Dr. Rosunil V. Patankar from Mumbai, Dr. Ramana Murthy PV from Vijaywada, Dr. Srijal Patnaik from Bhubaneswar, Dr. Shalab Gupta from Dasiabar, Dr. Amit Srivastava from Agra, and Dr. Bhirapa in from Hyderabad. First and foremost, I would like to welcome Dr. Rosunil V. Patankar to orate Dr. Srijke Bansali. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this is going to play my slides to show some slides on uh, Dr. S.K. Uh, Bansali, who has been a teacher of all of us in Mumbai and in the west of the country. Uh, to read his citation, Dr. Shirish Kanchanlal Bansali was born on the 21st of September, 1929 at Mumbai. His medical education was from KM Hospital and the state GS Medical College, from where he won 16 gold medals and the Ken Bahadurji Scholarship for Surgery in 1952. He was awarded the GW Kane Gold Medal in Surgery in 1953 and completed his MS in General Surgery in 1957. Further to this, Dr. Bansali went to the United Kingdom to train at the Royal Marsden Hospital, got his FRCS in England in 1958, and on his return to India, joined the famous Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, as assistant surgeon. In 1962, Dr. Bansali started working in Bhatia Hospital as honorary surgeon, and in 66, joined TNMC College and the BYL Nair Charitable Hospital as an assistant honorary. In 1980, he became the director of the Department of General and GI Surgery at the Jislok Hospital Research Center, and also became consultant surgeon at the Breach Candy Hospital in Mumbai. Truly a general surgeon in every respect, Dr. Bansali's particular interest was in HPB surgery, critical care and endocrine surgery. Sir was awarded the best teacher prize by the Alumni Association of the TNMC College and by the ASI. He was awarded a scroll of honor by the Indian Association of Surgical Oncology for distinguished service in the field of oncology by the then Prime Minister of India, Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Most of all, Dr. Shirish K. Bansali was a revered and passionate surgical teacher. He devoted his entire life to the art, practice, <laughs> and science of surgery and breathed his last on the 27th of April, 2009. Dr. Ramna, you can take it from there. Yes. yes. Good evening. Dr. Birappa is a very good friend of mine for the past 30 years. And he is one of the most pleasant people to have him around, particularly in the evenings. Dr. Birappa completed his medical studies in 1985 from MR Medical College in Gulbarga, Karnataka, and then obtained his master's in surgery from Mysore Medical College in 1990. He has the fellowship in minimal access surgery and is fellow of Association of Surgeons of India. He has since attended many courses to seek advanced competence in minimal, minimal access surgery and then followed his passion to excel in hepatobiliary and pancreatic work, and to finally in liver transplantation too. Dr. Birappa began his surgical career in 1990 as a surgical registrar in the Department of General Surgery at the very prestigious Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad, and has worked his way up in the academic ladder to currently being the professor and head of the Department of Surgical Gastroenterology at the same institute. A true academician all the way, Dr. Birappa has always been at the forefront of academic activities, a favored teacher and guide for surgical postgraduates. He is also a popular postgraduate examination mm -hmm. examiner in general surgery and for surgical gastroenterology too. At surgical meetings and gatherings, his involvement is with keynote addresses, many invited lectures, group and panel discussions, and his various paper presentations. He has authored over 45 publications into this busy schedule is his involvement as principal investigator in many clinical trials and research projects assigned to his department at uh, Nizam's Institute. The icing on the surgical career for Dr. Birappa is being the team lead to perform the first living donor, donor liver transplant in government hospital in Telangana. So blessed with administrative and organizational skills, Dr. Birappa is the center of many committees and conferences. Dr. Birappa's work has earned him several recognitions and awards and most valuable one being declared as the best doctor of Telangana state in 2017. He has an entry into Limca Book of Records for removing the largest cystic tumor of the liver. 
married to padmavati he has two children one of whom is following his footsteps as a doctor the association of surgeons of india is proud and privileged and honored to have the ever smiling gracious and most competent surgeon dr birappa to be the auditor of dr sk bansali's in 2020 and his topic would be benign lesions of the pancreas a diagnostic and management dilemma three decades of experience i welcome dr birappa to take over and deliver his oration thank you uh, dr ramanamurthy it's my pleasure let me thank dr raghuram the president of association of surgeons of india dr arvind kumar the former president of asi and the dynamic academician and director of academic sciences dr santosh john abraham for giving me this opportunity i thank all the governing council members and my dear friend dr ramana murthy also for giving me this opportunity it's my privilege and honor to deliver a oration named after a great doyen of indian surgery dr sirish bansali memorial oration thank you very much i have chosen a topic which is very close to my heart you know the technology has been changing a lot from a great big incision to a scarless a surgeries and robotic surgeries and what not and what not but we cannot bring back a great teachers the great surgeons like dr k sirish bansali so the topic which i liked very much is benign lesions of the pancreas my experience i share my experience of 30 years in nizam institute of medical sciences the challenges the diagnosis and management dilemmas you know that surgical knowledge depends on long 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 practice not from a speculations so if you see this picture it's very difficult to say the which is pseudocyst and which is cystic neoplasm of the pancreas probably if the patient gives in a history of pancreatitis you may think it's in a pseudocyst but asymptomatic a lesion in the pancreas this kind of a lesion it's very very difficult to say whether it's in a pseudocyst or in a cystic neoplasm of the pancreas no imaging modalities are sufficiently accurate to differentiate between benign and pre malignant lesion and you can see the radiological accuracy even if you take an mr mr cp or ct scan the the accuracy ranges from 40 to 95% it's a very very varied range and you know to diagnose percutaneous aspiration is not to be done and if at all it's to be done it's to be done endoscopically guided ultrasound guided aspiration again there are few reports that along the track malignant cells may be there if at all if they're in the cyst may track along the track so the ideal management also a little bit controversial and number of for a number of reasons in the sense we do not know exactly the natural history of the lesions we all pretty well know the predictors of carcinom of the pancreas if uh, a male comes to you with the pain in the abdomen and mass in the pancreas with, loss, with history of loss of weight and appetite based on a tumor size we think it's an malignancy however benign lesions are difficult to diagnose sometimes and if you see this case a young lady who presents with an bilious vomiting and pain in the abdomen for last 3 months which was typical of pancreatic pain and on examination she had an succussion class and an exam on upper gi endoscopy there was an extrinsic impression so endoscopy start it could be an exist or it could be an malignancy but however the biopsy did not reveal any conclusion also on showed an heterogeneous mass in the head of the pancreas and the tumor markers were with the normal normal limits if you can see the ct scan of the same patient there is a vague mass in the head of the pancreas which was creating in fact obstructing the duodenum as well as having the pain so we decided to go ahead in view of pain and vomiting and whipple's pancreatic duodenectomy was done in view of a mass in the head region and on examination of the specimen there was an cystic areas and and biopsy report turned out to be in a, a group pancreatitis it's in a it's in a case of a simple chronic pancreatitis which is confined to the groove that's in the head of the pancreas 
Ideally, this kind of patients, if you are diagnosed preoperatively, needs an, a conservative management. However, there are some indications for in a surgery, if you're not able to rule out malignancy or the patient has any complications of chronic pancreatitis, yes, we need to do a, a surgical procedure, sometimes like an impulse procedure. You can see, I'll be going through some of the uh, cases. Here, if you see a, a lady who has worked up for some other problem in the abdomen and which showed a small cystic lesion in the uh, in the pancreas, in the head of the pancreas, which was an asymptomatic. So, so what is the amazing diagnosis? <clears throat> the first thing we get is probably an cystic lesion. How accurate is CT in this diagnosis? Again, it's very difficult to differentiate between a simple serous cystodenoma and miscellaneous cystodenoma in these cases. So do you have any other investigating modalities to confirm this diagnosis? Yes, we have, that is endoscopic ultrasonography. So this lesion was four centimeter lesion. Should this a four centimeter lesion really need investigation further? Yes, according to the, some of the guidelines, any size of lesion in the pancreas, you will have to rule out malignancy or pre-malignancy. So we have various kind of investigations. So the radialist diagnosis, we come back to the same case, the radialist diagnosis was serious cystic uh, neoplasm of the pancreas. However, miscellaneous cystic neoplasm could not be ruled out in this patient. So now decision is to be made. We need to make a decision whether to remove this lesion or not. So, or whether we need to observe. So if it is an observe, so what kind of observation? So the patient, if the lesion is less than four centimeters, say if this lesion is three centimeters, and if you are sure that this is in a serous cystic neoplasm, well, you can, you can observe and six monthly CT scan for first year and later yearly. Whereas if, this, if it is more than four centimeters, then a surgery is needed. So as per this, if you go to the literature, in most of the patients who, who while observing, if the size increases by 19% or if there are changes in the morphology of the lesion, we need to go ahead with a surgery. Now next comes what kind of a surgery we need to do. Is it in a simple unucleation or in a resection? Resection amounting, amounting to distal pancreatectomy or a central pancreatectomy? Yes, enucleation sometimes will it be useful? Yes, it will be done, but provided it's away from the pancreatic duct. That can be best judged by doing an intraoperative ultrasonography or an endoscopic ultrasonography. Whereas if you do an a resection, it's in a blind resection, you might remove the assist with the pancreas, hence in the future they may have an exocrine endocrine deficiency. Whereas the results is concerned, unucleation is an equal into a resection. So this patient they, uh, needed a surgery because the size was more than four centimeters and miscellaneous cystic neoplasm was, could not be ruled out. Hence, we did in a unucleation of the lesion. You can see the transimulation, it was in a, a clear cyst with no evidence of malignancy. We have a few more uh, cystic neoplasms of the pancreas, such as serous uh, miscellaneous cystic neoplasm, intraductal papillary miscellaneous neoplasm, that's called an IPMN, and uh, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm as pent. Mostly we see serous cystodenomas and miscellaneous cystic neoplasms also. Predominantly, these occur in young women, which are character characterized by low grade potential for the development of malignancy. And once if you resect, they have an high cure rate. So, Intraductal papillary miscellaneous neoplasm, which usually occurs in a male uh, over 70 years of age, predominantly in the men, and it's a pre-malignant uh, lesion, like a miscellaneous cystic neoplasm, which is also a pre-malignant lesion. So we have in a various kinds of uh, classification in IPMN, I'll come back to that. And we have two more like serous cystic neoma, solid pap pseudopapillary tumor. Solid pseudopapillary tumor, which occurs in the younger age group, and it runs in the families, has low malignant potential. So how to differentiate between a pseudocyst and cystic tumor? If the patient has a history of pancreatitis, if the patient has a history of pancreatic trauma, maybe you can think of it in a pseudocyst and they usually have a low viscosity fluid if you aspirate, not percutaneously, but again, endoscopic ultrasonographic aspiration. And whereas in cystic tumor, they're all multilocalated, thick-walled, and there's no ductal communication except in IPMN, and they have a high viscosity fluid. We have some markers, tumor markers, which help us to diagnose uh, miscellaneous cystic neoplasm as well as introductal papillary miscellaneous neoplasm by doing an, a CEA. CEA is, if it's high, then we can think of miscellaneous cystic neoplasm as well as IPMN, whereas in serous cystodenoma, they're wrong.
normal. Unless if it is high, then we can consider that in a pseudocyst of the pancreas. So this is a classical radiological picture of the serous cyst now where you can have a honeycomb appearance and central scar it's like in a star burst uh, uh, appearance of an uh, appearance on a CT scan and the distal pancreatectomy with splenectomy was done in these patients. You can see there here if it yes if it is not indicated nowadays we have a better MRCP investigation. So you can see the tenting of an pancreatic duct. Usually they do not obstruct the pancreatic duct, but however. Sometimes they do obstruct a, a bile duct, causing an obstructive jaundice. So this young lady, we have a multiple loculated cyst in the in the head of the pancreas, and uh, so this is like this. This is confined at the neck of the pancreas. We were initially doing in a very radical surgeries like in a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy, or else, or else we were doing an Whipple's procedure. However, the lesion is at the neck of the pancreas. We might do an a procedure called as a median pancreatectomy. Or a central pancreatectomy, wherein, wherein we can we can we can excise the lesion and close the proximal stump and do a pancreaticogenostomy for the distal stump like this. So I just would like to share a small video of a procedure. So this is an a where we we are opening the lesser sac. Ramana, are you able to see the video? Hello? No, we can't see the video. Okay, okay, okay. The video is not playing. Okay, okay. It's playing, but video is not playing. One second, I'll come back. Yes, now, right. we, now we can see. Yeah, this is uh, 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 wherein they can see the lesion here and uh, mobilize the entire pancreas. Open the lesser sac and go to the pancreas. And you can see the lesion here. Mobilize the entire pancreas and go to the portal vein and make a tunnel, portal vein, and splenic artery and splenic vein, you can see. And that's in a lesion. And after transfixing the pancreas, one centimeter from the lesion, we can divide the pancreas. And the proximal stump is uh, transfixed. Case would be taken to identify the duct and as well as transfixing the duct and then mobilize the tumor. There'll be few branches from the pancreas, small venous branches from the pancreas entering into the splenic vein. You can see that splenic vein and we have ligated all the small branches that's the splenic artery for the proximal control in case if it bleeds. And mobilize that splenic vein. And we need to have at least five centimeters of uh, distal pancreas to do a median pancreatectomy. And one centimeter, and it's always better to do a, a frozen of the borders, margins, in order to rule out malignancy. Identify the duct. If the duct is more than four millimeter, we do duct to mucose anastomosis. If it is less than that, we, we stent the pancreatic duct. So that's the duct being is identified and a stent, small stent has been placed. A row and Y jejunum is being prepared. Divided with stapler. And here we are doing a dunking pancreatic jejunostomy and this, this stent is uh, brought out, it will be removed after two weeks. That's a posterior layer. And the anterior being layer is being sutured. And that completes the anastomosis.
So, and this is uh, another uh, macrocystic uh, variety of serous cyst adenoma, wherein a distal panctectomy has been done, which was very close to the uh, uh, spleen. So, we had one patient where uh, we did an, a, a cyst adenoma excision, and after a few years, almost 10 years, he came back with an recurrence, which is uh, not reported in the literature. It's an recurrent serous cyst adenoma. There was no malignancy. In fact, malignancy following serous cyst adenoma is not reported. So another uh, lady who has uh, uh, a very big uh, lump in the abdomen, it's almost occupying the entire abdomen, which involving the, it looks like as if it involves the celiac trunk. Sorry to interrupt you, but your main screen is not showing your slides. Sorry. No? No, sir. Video is still static. Okay. Get rid of the video. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll... I think, sir, close this and reopen the new one. Okay. Yeah, we can see your slides. Just go to yeah. full screen mode, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this lady uh, has in a very big uh, lesion uh, in the in the pancreas, and it was diagnosed to be an, a a pseudo cyst of the pancreas. But we went in and did a, a very extensive uh, resection, but turned out to be an emissionous cystic neoplasm of the pancreas with the intermediate grade dysplasia. Again, the section from the proximal resected margins were free from the tumor. So this patient, since there was some amount of uh, dysplasia, so we followed up after six months, there was no recurrence. And after two years, this patient came with a small recurrence, which was again excised. So it indicates that a, a size of more than uh, four or five centimeters and presence of a solid component and wall thickness, they are the uh, predictors of malignancy. So in a mystery cystic neoplasm, presence of mural nodules, eccentric solid component and calcification are also sometimes uh, shows malignancy. If the cyst fluid CEA is more than 6,000 nanograms per liter per ml, it means that this patient might have a uh, malignancy. So cyst in cyst appearance is in a classical of missing cystic neoplasm. So another entity is IPMN. So wherein uh, we can have an, a main duct IPMN, side branch IPMN, and combined IPMN. And uh, we have, an, a, if you do an, a side wing endoscopy, you will see a lot of mucus coming out of uh, the ampulla. So this is how it looks like uh, main duct IPMN and we have an, a branch duct IPMN and also mixed IPMN. So they'll have an, a classical features of pancreatic duct dilatation. It looks almost like an, a chronic pancreatitis with enhancing mural nodules. It means they have an, a malignancy. You can see this patient's entire pancreas is totally completely replaced by a, a cyst like a punch of grape skin. So this, we did a, a complete total pancreatectomy and uh, with a splenectomy and turned out to be an IPMN with low-grade malignancy. So another entity is a SPEN, which usually seen in runs in a families with low malignant potential, occurs in young females of 30 years. This is how it looks like. Most of the times, the radiologists think that it could be an hydrated sister and liver abscess, but it's not. It's an pseudocyst SPEN of uh, pancreas and where we did a pupil's pancreatic adenectomy, it's complete excision is possible in these cases. Sometimes we may expect infiltration into the local uh, uh, vessels like portal vein. And if you're quite sure that it's an SPEN, maybe diurnum preserving uh, pancreatic head resection can be also done. We have reported 33 cases of SPEN from our institution. So this, again, it shows that infiltration into the portal vein where sometimes we need to resect the portal vein and do anastomosis. However, there's no evidence of malignancy in these patients. You can see a central scar there and portal vein was resected and anastomosed. This patient who presented with a painless progressive jaundice, almost typical of carcinoma head of the pancreas, all the, all the features, LFT, amazing, everything showed almost features like an uh, malignancy of the pancreas. But for our surface on the table, there are few tubercles and you can see on the stomach. So you can see the stomach, there are some few tubercles and there are nodes which biopsy showed a tuberculosis and biopsy from the pancreatic lesion also showed a tuberculosis. It's in a, nothing but a, a tuberculosis of the pancreas. So we abandoned the major procedure and since patient had an obstructive jaundice, we did an hepatic We were sometimes very aggressive in treating this, but 
at the end of the day, you find this kind of cases in our places, like hydratids is one patient underwent, pupils another patient, distal banktectomy, so endoscopic, ultrasonography, and the one, the person who does is also very important. So this lady, boy who has you know, some cystic lesion, very rare lesion, and we did in a central banktectomy, turned out to be an entric duplication of the cyst of the pancreas. The literature, hardly we have few case reports. And of course, we see a good number of cystic neuroendocrine tumors. They're all hypervascular and they have, they know sometimes it's always possible to resect these lesions. They are hypervascular. We had a distal pancreatectomy and all those things. And this lady who came with us without any symptoms, non specific symptoms, and also showed a very small lesion, 2.5 to 2.5 centimeter enhancing lesion in the head of the pancreas. We thought this could be may observed since she did not have any symptoms, but she came back after three years with an abstract to jaundice, which shows again there is a hyper intense lesion in the head of the pancreas with some more multiple lesions in the in the tail and body of the pancreas. So endocrine workup was done, which showed micro adenoma of the pituitary and hyperparathyroidism and and multiple endocrine dysplasia. <coughs> Dotanac PET, PET CT was also done, which also showed neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. So this patient underwent a total pancreatectomy, parathyroidectomy, and patient was put on medication for, for a prolactinoma of pitch study. So this boy, we had an, a fever and investigated to have an, a tumor in the pancreas, and we thought it's an a cystic neoplasm, but turned out to be an inflammatory pseudo tumor of the pancreas, and the boy is doing well. So this is usually seen in the gastrointestinal tract, not in the solid organs, but we had in a patient we had a, a, a gastrointestinal tumor, which was arising from the pancreas. So we had almost 175 uh, cases of uh, benign lesions of the pancreas. And if you see in the first 15 years, we had only 15 cases, one or two cases per year. But in the rest of the 15 years, say in 2006 to 2020, we had seen 160 cases of benign lesions of the pancreas. Of course, more were females, 73% and men or 27%. Most of them are symptomatic in terms of pain, pancreatitis or bleed, and they had, some of them had exocrine endocrine deficiency, and some of them had in a raised tumor markers. That's how we could diagnose mucinous cystic neoplasm. And these are the location of the tumor. 110 patients had a, a tumor in the body and tail of the pancreas. 57 had a in the head of the pancreas, and rest six in the neck and multifocal in two patients. So we are done distal pancreatectomy splenectomy in 72 patients, distal pancreatectomy in two patients, and central pancreatectomy or median pancreatectomy in 34 patients, and pupils in 63 patients, total pancreatectomy in two patients, and unucleation in two patients. So we have also done uh, uh, laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy in nine patients, and eight had laparoscopic assisted, and two, three of them Two patients died in the post-operative period due to complications, and a few of them had a pancreatic fistula too. So these are our final histopathological reports, and we had an SPEN of 83 cases, and IPMN two cases, mucinous cystic neoplasms 11 cases, serous cystodenoma 29 cases. We had neuroendocrine tumors almost 41 cases, and rest nine patients. So the rules of surgery, one of the rules is don't play with the pancreas. Hence more does not hold good. Definitely we can tame the pancreas and a safe surgery can be performed. So before concluding, I would like to uh, 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 conclude with a, a good algorithm. Any pancreatic benign or cystic lesion for uh, the diagnosis based on ultrasound, a CT scan, good CT, pancreatic protocol CT, or an MR, MRCP, which help us in characterizing the lesion. If there are no worrisome features like uh, size and uh, and uh, solid component and uh, um, uh, other things. We, uh, repeat imaging can be done after six months. If there is no change, annual CT scan or MRI can be done. If duct is dilated and cyst is more than three centimeters in presence of mural nodal, endoscopic ulcinography with FNS and cytology, concern features, surgery to be done. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I thank all the Goni Council members of ASI for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much.
Well done. Great job and great work. I know all about your work. Um, this is really even surprising to me. The numbers are huge. That's great work, uh, Birappa. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, doctor.